Hello, everyone. Welcome, everyone, and thank you for braving the rain to join us today. Um, before I introduce our speaker, Michael Darcy, I wanted to mention a few things happening at the club. Tomorrow morning uh, for breakfast, at, uh, starting at 8.15, uh, we are going to have the fifth in our breakfast briefing series of trainings um, related to the Hong Kong protests. We've had them on safety, technology, um, and uh, forgetting the rest, legal, we've had, <laughs> we've had so many. Um, so tomorrow's will be on first aid, which uh, having seen some of the, um, uh, the protests this weekend um, is, a, is a very well-timed one. We'll have members of the Hong Kong Red Cross joining us. Uh, everyone is welcome, all journalists, uh, members, guests, so uh, there's still uh, availability, so sign up when you leave today if you're interested. On Thursday, we'll have uh, the uh, next of our wall exhibits for September. It's on rain. We've had, um, we had the Hong Kong protests past and present this past month, which was uh, quite, a, quite an exhibit. And this one is a, uh, a more kind of arty one. But it's supposed to be lovely, and we'll have the reception on Thursday. Uh, so now it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Michael Darcy, who's an Irish financial services minister. And we have him, he's in town just for a short time, so we're very lucky to have, uh, very fortunate to have him with us. He's headed to Tokyo after this. And of course, he's coming at a very interesting time given the topic of his speech, which is Brexit and Irish perspective. When we invited him, we knew it would be timely. We didn't realize how exact, how just how timely it would be with Parliament meeting this week to see if they um, will indeed suspend uh, starting uh, um, on the 12th. So, uh, and with that October 31st deadline uh, fast approaching, the question of how the UK will leave the European Union, of course, remains unclear. Uh, Mr. Darcy will give us, will offer the Irish government's perspective on the withdrawal agreement, what a no deal Brexit could mean, and the potential implications also for our very own Hong Kong. He is the Minister of State at Ireland's Department of Finance and the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform with special responsibility for financial services and insurance. He was appointed in June uh, 2017. He's been a member of parliament uh, since 2016 and from, 20, uh, from 2007 to 2011, he was a senator from 2011 to 2016. I give you our speaker. Um, I'm, I'm inclined to say good morning because uh, my, my body clock is saying it's very early in the morning. Uh, thank you for inviting me here today, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, and the, the, break, the to topic being Brexit, um, everything seems to be Brexit at the moment, which is understandable. The UK's departure from the EU poses a unique and unprecedented challenge for Ireland. The UK is a key partner, our closest neighbour, our friend, and a key collaborator in the EU. No other country in the EU is as interconnected with the UK historically, culturally, politically, socially, and economically. Hong Kong, of course, will appreciate this fact also. The UK and Ireland's shared EU membership over the last 45 years has been an important feature of that relationship in all aspects. It is no accident that the strengthened trust and close friendship between us as peoples, where we are co guarantors of peace on our islands, coincided with the period of common EU membership. Brexit was not our choice and it would come at a cost to us, to the EU and to the UK alike. While we deeply regret the UK's decision, we along with our EU partners have respected their decision. The European Commission on behalf of the remaining 27 member states engaged in long and intensive negotiations with the UK government. The aim was to facilitate the UK's orderly withdrawal and to provide reassurance and certainty for both sides as we move into a new phase, a new phase post Brexit. There was real compromise on both sides, resulting in the withdrawal agreement agreed last November by the European Council and the British government. The agreement provides for a transition period, giving us time to negotiate what we hope will be a deep and ambitious agreement on the future relationship between the EU and the UK. 
It provides the basis to start those negotiations in an ordered and constructive way. It remains our view that the best and only way to ensure an orderly withdrawal is the ratification of the withdrawal agreement. I do want to speak about the backstop, which has been much discussed. Uh, the Irish backstop addresses the unique situation on the island of Ireland and forms an essential, essential element of the withdrawal agreement. From Ireland's point of view, since the British people made their decision to leave the European Union, the Irish government has sought to ensure that we can minimise the negative impacts of Brexit on our island. In particular, we have sought to protect Northern Ireland's peace process and the Good Friday Agreement for which we share responsibility with the UK government. Avoiding a hard border on the island of Ireland is not just about trade, customs and regulatory controls. It is about protecting the Good Friday Agreement, the north-south cooperation that flows from and underpins that agreement, and the welfare of border communities north and south. North-south economic and social cooperation benefits people across the island and underpins the peace process and the Good Friday Agreement. This is most clearly felt to the open border that currently exists between Northern Ireland and Ireland. This is why the withdrawal agreement includes a protocol on Ireland and Northern Ireland. And the back backstop is that mechanism. It was negotiated and agreed on the basis of the EU and the UK's shared understanding of the need to address these unique circumstances on the island of Ireland. It is designed to ensure that there can be no re-emergence of a hard border on the island of Ireland, while at the same time protecting the EU single market and Ireland's place within that single market. The backstop has gained strong support of the majority of political parties in Northern Ireland, as well as community, business and farming groups. They understand that it is necessary to protect the peace and the stability on our island, which we and the British government together with the people of Northern Ireland have painstakingly built over the past 21 years. They have welcomed the backstop as an important insurance policy and its future stability and prosperity. We cannot understate the risks a no-deal Brexit poses to the peace and stability of Northern Ireland and the overwhelming wish across society in Northern Ireland not to return to borders and divisions of the past. The backstop provides essential reassurance that this will not happen. It acts as an insurance policy which we hope will never be used. Our priority remains to achieve a future relationship agreement that can resolve all these issues. Together with our partners in the European Union, we are committed committed to begin exploring alternative arrangements for avoiding a hard border once the withdrawal agreement is ratified. The backstop is currently the only viable solution that avoids any inf physical infrastructure and related checks and controls, preserves the all-Ireland all -Ireland economy, and fully protects the Good Friday Agreement, as well as the integrity of this EU single market. Ireland and the EU are at one on this. This is why Prime Minister Johnson's proposal to abolish the backstop is completely unacceptable. It is deeply worrying that he has decided to step back from the commitments provided by the UK in their negotiations with the EU over the past two years and more. In a no-deal scenario, there are no easy answers. Ireland will continue to work closely with the European Commission to see how the border can be addressed, sharing the twin objectives of protecting the single market and Ireland's place within it, and avoiding a hard border, including physical infrastructure. However, any such arrangements will be inferior to the backstop in terms of fully mitigating the risks posed by Brexit to the Good Friday Agreement and the peace process. So where do we stand now? In April, following a request from the UK Prime Minister, Theresa May, the European Council agreed to an extension of the Article 50 process until the 31st of October of this year. This provided 
the UK with more time to work towards an orderly withdrawal. But an extension is not a solution. We will work closely with Prime Minister Johnson's government to continue our close and friendly bilateral cooperation. We remain open to considering any ideas put forward by the UK, so long as they are compatible with the withdrawal agreement. However, as the European Council has consistently made clear, the withdrawal agreement, including the backstop, cannot be opened, reopened, or renegotiated. The EU has always made clear that it is open to looking again at the political declaration on the EU-UK future relationship. The EU and Ireland are fully committed to achieving an ambitious and comprehensive future partnership with the UK. Ultimately, the answers lie with Westminster, as they have always done. A no deal will not be our choice. The only clear way to avoid this is to ratify the withdrawal agreement. The EU's solidarity on this position remains resolute, a point many EU leaders have made directly to Prime Minister Johnson recently. Given political developments, London, however, a no-deal Brexit on the 31st of October is an ever more significant risk, a risk this government takes extremely seriously. Such a decision by the UK would have profound political and economic implications for the UK, including more significantly for Northern Ireland, as well as for Ireland and the EU. <coughs> Excuse me. No deal means that the UK will fall outside the single market and the customs union with no trade or cooperation agreements in place with the EU and no transition period. It will be impossible for the UK to maintain the current seamless arrangements with the EU, EU across the range of sectors from justice and security cooperation to transport connectivity to trade flows and supply chains. This has significant implications for Ireland and the impact of a no-deal Brexit will be profound across many sectors and areas of economic and social life. No-deal Brexit preparations have the highest priority across the Irish government. Ireland and the EU have engaged in extensive work to prepare. In Ireland, the government published an updated contingency action plan in July, which gives us an overview of the comprehensive cross-government preparations that began even before the Brexit vote and the steps that have been taken up to the 31st of October of this year. Extensive measures already in place, prepared in advance of the original 29th of March deadline. This includes the passage of the Brexit omnibus bill signed into law by the President on the 17th of March. We will continue to refine infrastructure at ports and airports to enhance our capacity to manage the necessary checks and controls on goods coming from the UK as smoothly as possible. We will also con con continue work with EU, the UK partners on securing our land bridge connection through the UK to the continent of Europe. As we head towards the 31st of October, the government will continue to work to strengthen the resilience of the economy and to prepare for Brexit. We will do so as a strong and committed member of the EU and with the solidarity and the support of our European partners. The Commission is committed to supporting Ireland in addressing the specific challenges of Irish businesses and we will continue our engagement with Member States and the EU Commission. At the EU level, work has been set out in five European Commission communications, the latest of which was published on the 12th of June, as well as more than 90 Brexit preparedness notices. The EU has adopted 18 primary legislative measures on a unilateral temporary basis to mitigate the worst effects of a no-deal Brexit. A, member of these are, a number of these are in key areas for Ireland, including air connectivity, road haulage, access, as well as maintaining funding for Northern Ireland. Ultimately, it is only by government, business and citizens working together, as well as with our partners in the EU, that we can aim to mitigate as far as possible the severe impacts of a no-deal Brexit and ensure that we are preparing for the challenges that it will bring. It's time left to the 31st of October. We will be working with our businesses and other exposed sectors to step up their preparedness. 
there should be no illusions. A no-deal outcome will be very damaging for Ireland, for the EU, but particularly for the UK. The best and arguably the only way to avoid a damaging outcome and to get on with negotiating a positive future relationship is to ratify the withdrawal agreement as negotiated. I'm sure that our partners in there in Asia share this view. In uncertain times, some things remain clear. Ireland's journey as a committed member of the European Union will continue. And we want to do this while maintaining the closest possible relationship with Great Britain. Ireland will continue to maintain its strong and constructive bilateral relationship with the UK. In May, Antonis Simon Coveney signed a memorandum of understanding on the common travel area with David Linnington, the British cabinet minister. This reaffirms both countries' commitment to the common travel area and to maintain the associated rights and privileges our citizens benefit from underneath it. This will ensure that Ireland, Irish and UK citizens can continue to reside, work, study, access health care, social security and public services in each other's countries. It remains our priority to achieve the closest possible relationship with the UK post-Brexit. Brexit is an important reminder of how, the European, how important the European Union is to a country like Ireland. The EU has demonstrated real unity in addressing Brexit. For us, the solidarity and the support of our EU partners has been the hallmark of this process, for which we are profoundly grateful. There can be no better example of what EU membership means to a smaller member state like Ireland. The EU has been at the centre of the progress that we have made over many recent decades, and our EU membership will remain central to our planning for the future which lies ahead. It remains the bedrock of our economic development and well-being, driven by the single market, a foundation stone of the EU that must be protected. We will not be leaving the EU, and we remain fully committed to playing our part at the heart of the Union, a Union which we want to continue to be outward-looking and progressive, secure, and prosperous. Thank you very much. We have time for questions. Um, and when you ask a question, if you could identify yourself and uh, your affiliation, if you have one, particularly a news organization. And there are uh, microphones uh, that would be brought around. So. Who wants to ask a question? Nobody. Thank Nobody. you for coming. <laughs> Takes it. They have to warm up I, a little bit. Oh, okay. Simon will ask a question. Thank you, Simon Pritchard with GavCal Research. Um, you you mentioned that you're uh, that you've got a long way to go with No Deal planning. Can you sort of talk specifically about the No Deal planning that Ireland has got in place and? what your contingencies are for dealing with the border uh, in the event of there being a hard Brexit? Yeah. So in terms of no deal planning, we've uh, announced our summer economic statement uh, a number of weeks ago. So just to put into context the extent of which a order, an orderly Brexit in terms of finance, we believe that for 2020, the budget arithmetic are that we can have a surplus of about 1.4 billion euros. Uh, a disorderly Brexit potentially could mean a deficit of 5 billion. So it's about a 6.5 billion euro swing from a surplus to a deficit for Ireland. And that's a huge range in which we have to prepare for the potential that a no deal damaging Brexit disorderly um, could occur to us. So in the scheme of where we find ourselves, um, we're preparing for that. So it's important that you can't consider Brexit for Ireland in finance alone. So anybody who's, who knows or understands Irish history will know that since independence almost 100 years ago, every generation there's been a border campaign. So if you have a border, if you have a different tariffs on either side of the border, 
potentially you give the opportunity for some people who are criminals to take that opportunity to start a criminal structure, put themselves in the guise of being nationalists, that they are supporting a united Ireland. And from what has happened and flowed in the 1930s, 40s, 50s, starting in the 60s, we had 30 years of the Troubles. And we are not prepared to lose or even have the risk of losing peace on the, island, on the island of Ireland under any circumstances. Our prosperity on the island of Ireland started when the Good Friday Agreement was concluded in 1998, 21 years ago. We had three decades of madness. We are not prepared to facilitate that for Brexit or for anything else. Other questions? There's one in the back here. Hi, my name's David, and uh, my heritage, I have people from both sides of the border um, and things. I'm, I'm curious, um, will the North people still be able to gain citizenship in Ireland because it's one island? And then also, um, I mean, as we know in Belfast right now, Parliament, their Parliament building is empty. <laughs> They're not doing anything, and, you know, and I know there's several people in the North that are in favor of Brexit, but... Um, do the, how is, uh, how should I say, does London really care what happens to the North that much? Because they obviously haven't even solved the problem now that's going on in Belfast. Yeah, so in terms of citizenship, I spoke about the common travel area. So some of you will know that the common travel area was the Anglo-Irish Agreement of 1921, uh, signed by on the British side, it was signed by uh, Lord George, who was the Prime Minister. Uh, people like uh, Lord Birkenhead, Freddie Smith, uh, Austin Chamberlain, uh, Neville Chamberlain's half-brother, who was the then leader of the Conservative Party. And the fourth person in that delegation was Winston Churchill. And on the Irish side, it was signed by uh, Arthur Griffith and Michael Collins and others. So that was the agreement that introduced the Irish Free State, which subsequently uh, became the independence of Ireland. And the Republic was formed in the late 1940s. So that agreement has stood since we became an independent nation from, the United, from Great Britain. So nothing changes there. Um, nothing changes there, thankfully. And Ireland is the only country where the 28 current member states of the European Union will be able where all citizens will be able to work after Brexit. So all British citizens can work in Ireland because of the common travel area, and of course because of European Union membership, all other of the other 26 member states, and Ireland is 27, that we are the only jurisdiction where that will happen. So there is no change to the common travel area. That converse, part of the conversation is concluded. In terms of no administration in Northern Ireland, it is very disappointing. Um, I, I absolutely believe London wants an administration in Northern Ireland. Um, Northern Ireland is a complicated political entity. Um, it is polarised, and that isn't good. And it's always difficult when you have polarising positions. Uh, but at some point in the future, the political parties in Northern Ireland absolutely must get back talking and absolutely must re-establish the Assembly in Belfast. Other questions? Hi, uh, Nick Andrews from Gavco. Um, a question on the backstop. Is there any way that it could be amended to create a situation that the Irish government would prefer over a no-deal Brexit? Because that seems to be the situation. Yeah, the, the Irish government have been very clear that we're prepared to listen to any um, solutions that the UK government um, have to offer. But as of yesterday, nothing new has been presented to the European Union. So the British government don't present to, to Ireland. They present to the European Union, of which we're party to those negotiations with our 26 other member state partners. Um, 
We are prepared to be flexible. We are prepared to listen. But it will form part of the political declaration rather than the withdrawal agreement. The withdrawal agreement is concluded. It's finished. It will not be reopened. And some people um, don't believe that that is the case. Um, unfortunately, we keep saying it. The Commission keeps saying it. Uh, Michel Barnier keeps saying it. And yet it is not believed in some parties, um, which is unfortunate. questions? Yeah, there's one over here. Thank you. Uh, Tony Watson, Hong Kong Society of Financial Analysts. Uh, November 1, what happens on your side of the border? I know you can't speak to what the UK is going to do, but what plans does Ireland have? What's the border going to look like? So in, in terms of on the 1st of November, if the, if the UK crash out is what you're getting at. On the 1st of November, the same three primary questions will be asked of the UK government in relation to citizens' rights, uh, their responsibility in relation to funds that are due to the European Union, and also the UK government's solution for the border on the island of Ireland problem. So it's about five months ago, Michel Barnier and his team visited the Department of Finance. I met with Ms. Michel Barnier and his team with my senior minister, Pascal Donoghue. And it was there that he said, at that point, same three primary questions the obligation will be on the UK to answer because they are the people who are leaving. And if they haven't answered them at that point, it will be even more difficult because on the 1st of November, there will be a third country in a different negotiating position than as a current member state. So we don't know what will happen subsequently. It is essential that the single market is protected. And the single market has been hugely beneficial for all of Europe. Um, a lot of people have forgotten or don't know that the single market was the brainchild of former Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher. Other questions? Yeah, there's one over here. Um, well, I'll ask one. <laughs> I thought um, I was getting away with it. <laughs> no, <laughs> President's choice. Um, so, uh, well, you're obviously in touch with EU officials and without um, you know, destroying any confidences. Is it your sense that they are um, not in the mood to come up with another plan and that they're just going to let, if, if this is what ends up happening and, um, and Boris Johnson is, you know, makes good on his promise to go with a no-deal Brexit if that's what it takes, um, what is your sense? Will they try to come up with a last-minute deal? It, the European Union is available every day to come up with a solution. But the solution has to come from the UK side. And to date, as of yesterday, nothing new has been presented that hadn't already been presented before and rejected before. And that's the position that we find that the European Union finds itself in. And the European Union does not want a no deal. They've negotiated over 30 months, two and a half years, and the withdrawal agreement is the position that has been signed off by 28 governments, including the previous UK government, of which Boris Johnson on the last occasion that he voted for. So the European Union isn't the stumbling block. The stumbling block here is the House of Commons getting a true uh, parliament in London. What about an extension? Well, an extension won't be consented to unless there's a legitimate reason. So this won't be continued. We've had two extensions to date, and we still find ourselves asking the same questions, having the same conversations, coming close to each point of the extension. So we've been around this lap before. Um, so unless there's a very legitimate reason, I don't see an extension. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, Sarah Monks, a member of this club. You've mentioned that there are plans to help businesses cope with what's coming in, uh, 
Irish businesses. Um, what, what do those plans look like in very practical terms? What can you do to help businesses get through this? Thank you. Um, so we've, we have a number of funds that were made available from the Exchequer, uh, going back not to, to Budget 19, but also Budget 18. So we've, we have two 300 million euro funds for SMEs who potentially could find themselves in cash flow difficulties because of Brexit. So I, a bit of a concern is that enough of those haven't been drawn down just yet. Um, so potentially if the cash flow position is difficult for a company who find themselves on the wrong end of the supply chain, who find themselves not being able to export into the UK, um, that those cash flow funding opportunities may be required outside of normal banking practices. Um, is there a question here? Over here? Uh, sorry, Ben Richardson from Finsbury. Um, can I just ask one question about financial services and banks? Are you seeing increased interest of setting up operations in Ireland um, and a flow of personnel and funds? And has it picked up in the recent weeks? Um, I wouldn't say it's picked up in recent weeks. There was, to my surprise, uh, when I came into the job, uh, I was meeting institutions all the time. I, I wanted to be very clear that I wasn't there poach jobs from the UK. I was there as somebody who could be part of a solution for a company who would have passporting difficulties into the other EU 26 countries and Ireland following Brexit. Uh, I think that went down well. The UK are, aren't just our neighbours, they're not just our friends, the UK are also our family. To put into context, there are six million people who are entitled to an Irish passport in the UK, excluding Northern Ireland. There are about six and a half million people on the island of Ireland. And an Irish passport entitlement is a parent or a grandparent. Uh, so that doesn't even count the number of people who had moved in previous generations before that. So there is a pipeline. I was, I have to admit, I was very surprised. Our advice to companies war, was to prepare for the worst case scenario. And if that doesn't happen, then, well, that's great. You've over-prepared. It might cost you a little bit extra, but that's fine. So a lot of companies had the benefit of two extensions. Uh, to my surprise, the pipeline is flowing on all occasions. So as we get a number in for a licensing requirement or whatever it may be through the regulatory authorities, Central Bank of Ireland, as we get them in, through the pipeline and out, there are still more coming in. Uh, it varies in ranges and sizes, from the likes of Barclays, uh, which moved their European headquarters from London to Dublin, where you were looking at a transfer capital of about 300 billion euros, the largest, uh, to small fintech companies with three, four, five staff. Uh, and then you've also a lot of other companies who would have new business lines that were required licensing to the central bank because they were licensed for one service, but we're adding new and additional services. So we haven't seen anything new. Um, it's been pretty consistent from about a little over three, three and a half years ago. Over here. Um, sorry, this forward. Michael, I'd be remiss, I think, if we didn't bring up, I'm sorry, your tweet from last week. When you talked about Which tweet was that, sorry? <laughs> I had a lot of tweets last week. Well, there's one particular made it to many, many um, media outlets when you talked about um, the proroguing of the UK Parliament being the, what was it, the most undemocratic action since Cromwell established the Protectorate. Which, could you talk a little bit more about your views on the proroguing of the UK Parliament and what you think that might do you're very, you're very kind to raise that. Thank you very much. Um, I, I, I shouldn't be interfering in the UK government uh, structures. But I, I suppose what I can do is I can talk uh, more broadly about politics and democracy and 
God knows the UK is the mother of modern democracies. Uh, the Irish democracy, our structure is based upon theirs, as is a lot of other Western democracies. And so I'll speak in the general about democracy. And it is disappointing when, and it's, it's politics where it's moved to, I'm not sure why, but the discourse in politics internationally has moved in a direction to me as somebody who has watched politics all my life is disappointing. The structures, they may not be perfect, um, but I'm part of the European privileged generation. And I describe that by my generation and those a little bit older than me are the first Europeans who haven't gone to war. And that's the benefit of Europe and democracy and this strongly established political structures that we have in Europe. Um, on any occasion that they are diluted, to me as a Democrat, is very disappointing. But as you can see, I like history, and um, Cromwell isn't a, he isn't a known hero in Irish history. <laughs> There's a question over here. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jack Wagner. I work for an investigations firm here in Hong Kong. So. I don't expect you to know what's inside uh, Boris Johnson's mind, or he probably doesn't know himself. Um, but he was asked, and he's repeatedly evaded answering, what would the border actually look like? And you know, the whole point of the backstop is that, in theory, you should have some physical border to pass through as you're going through goods and things like that. So you know, how, what would the border actually look like if you don't have any physical infrastructure? Because he's been talking about, you know, this sort of science fiction, you know, z you know, scanning processes or something like that. Yeah. And and second question, I'm going to play a bit of devil's advocate here. Thank you. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that nothing has been presented by Johnson to the EU that hasn't already been presented and rejected. And I'm sure you know that the withdrawal agreement has been rejected in the British Parliament three times. So isn't it also on the EU's part to actually realize that if they truly want to avoid a no deal, they should revisit some of those things, even if they've been rejected in the past? So what will the border look like? As far as the government of Ireland are concerned, it will look like what it is currently like. Seamless, no infrastructure of any nature. That's what the backstop is about. So the backstop is is giving Northern Ireland the opportunity to have the best of both worlds. To have seamless flow, seamless trade uh, across, across the Irish Sea to the UK. There is no change to the constitutional status of Northern Ireland. But Northern Ireland is different. It is different than the rest of the United Kingdom. And it's different because of the, the, the complicated history between Ireland Northern Ireland and Great Britain. And we, the point I was making earlier was that on every generation there's been a, a border campaign. And the criminals pretend to be nationalists and republicans and dress themselves in the Irish flag. And in the name of nationalism, they're going to unite Ireland. If anything, they're doing the opposite. So what we can't have, just cannot facilitate the opportunity, under any circumstances, to lose peace. We cannot allow that. We will not allow that. And thankfully, and I'm very humbled when I'm in the negotiation rooms, when I'm meeting with senior EU officials, whether it's from the Commission or the Central Bank, we are fortunate to have the power of a continent 100% behind us. And one of the things that was a miscalculation was that potentially maybe all of Europe mightn't support Ireland in the way that they have. Um, one of the things that I didn't quite grasp was Eastern Europe knows more about borders than anybody else in Europe. And they have given us full support. Uh, we have the full support of 26 partners, along with the Commission, along with the Council. Um, 
Is it incumbent upon the EU to move because the House of Commons haven't? Um, we have said we are prepared to. And Ireland has said we are prepared to. Uh, we have said we are prepared to listen to any proposal that is capable of being implemented. But we can't pretend that we have a proposal that people are talking about that isn't available anywhere in the world, but that technology might apply at some point in the future. That's not a basis of a legitimate agreement. Okay, we have time for one last question. Oh, there's, okay, right here. Thank you. Sorry, can I just push you a little bit on, um, on the backstop and what will happen on the 1st of November? Because if England do crash out, Boris Johnson, whether you can believe it or not, says there will not, that the British government will not look to put a border in, <coughs> in Northern Ireland. Okay, thank you. Um, the the EU have said they yeah. will put a border the British government doesn't have the choice. They're legally obliged to, under World Trade Organization rules. The EU, the EU is also obliged to put a, put a customs check uh, between a non-EU country and an EU country. Northern, pardon? So what the backstop is designed to do, so that we, the hope and anticipation is to which all agreement is agreed. There'll be a transition period then moving into. And the transition period is to conclude a free trade agreement in which the EU and the UK will agree where the future will be. But it'll be a, an unusual free trade agreement because on this occasion, both parties are starting from the same starting position. So to me as a politician, I find it inconceivable that we don't know where both parties will be. The backstop is if there is no agreement at some point in the future, that the backstop would be that Northern Ireland would remain in the same regulatory structure as the island of Ireland but that they have, they're different to the UK, so they have the best of both worlds. The British government subsequently thought that was, that Northern Ireland shouldn't be in a different position to the rest of the UK, and they requested all of the UK, which is a British government request, for the backstop to apply to all of the UK. So that was a British government request, and then it was turned down by the Houses of Parliament following that request. So what will happen? As I said earlier, the same three questions will be asked. I'm on the record with an interview with Reuters, and this is a personal opinion. I've had this opinion for quite some time. In my view, a lot of people from Parliament in the House of Commons believe that the European Union will not allow the UK to crash out on the 31st of October. They are wrong. The European Union has made it very clear that the withdrawal agreement is concluded. We will consider the political declaration to be amended. It is very difficult to do a deal with somebody who doesn't believe you're telling them something will happen, will happen. And that's the circumstances that we find ourselves in. Again, I offered opinion to Reuters that in my view, the deal will be done after the 31st of October. But it will be more difficult for the UK to do that deal because there will be a third country outside of the rights that a member of the European Union will have. Will there be a border straight away? Very difficult to know. Very difficult to predict what will happen. Um, but there will be a legal obligation on both parties to implement controls and tariffs between two different jurisdictions, one EU and one non-EU. Oh, well, one more question, uh, right here. Right here. Thank you. Uh, Tony Watson again, Hong Kong Society of Financial Analysts. Um, in your opinion, if the UK uh, declines to make all or part of that 
uh, separation payment. Uh, will that be considered a sovereign default? I'm sure ISTA will be able to determine if it's a sovereign default or not. It'd be above my pay grade. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you all, um, and please join me in thanking our speaker.